Greetings, everybody. Nate Brown here, and I have I have this this man, Jonathan Schroer, a man who's done many things. If you look at his LinkedIn, he is a two X exit founder. He is an author. He is a creator of many fascinating business endeavors, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna go deep into the psyche of Jonathan Schroer today. So, hey, Jonathan, how's it going today? Uh, it's fantastic. I mean, I'm, I'm grateful, Nate, to, to talk to you. I'm also grateful that, you know, this is going to be, you know, part of the one business world, libraries, of founders and entrepreneurs and, and how we help the next generation really think about, you know, dreaming their business, building their business, and then in some cases selling their business. Um, and so I think it's, it's a huge opportunity. So it's, it's an honor to be part of one business world. With Stelios, and it's a it's a it's a great privilege to be interviewed by you, Nate. We're going to take a different approach than maybe other founders with One Business World. Rather than me presenting a presentation, Nate and I are going to do a fireside chat, and hopefully the the things that we share with you today are entertaining, are useful, relevant, and it's there's at least a couple of nuggets that you can take away to kind of help you kind of grow your business. Love it. The closest thing we have to a fire is this gnarly red beard. But we're gonna we're gonna get some intelligence out of Jonathan, Moore, which is not hard to do. Uh, so thank you, Jonathan. For, you're you're so generous with uh, with the things that you have learned. I know I know that you're often in the school system, educating, teaching, uh, extending these principles to others. So I, I think that's a really cool thing that you do. Yeah, so I, think, I think I think when you think about it, Nate, just to parlay into that a second yeah. is I think I mean it's kind of the ethos here of one business world, right? Is there's so many talented individuals in the world that want to do cool and amazing things that don't live in the tech hubs, right? They live all over the world. And so it's a yeah. privilege to be able to talk to Gen Z and millennials specifically, but you know, obviously other people found businesses too that have these amazing ideas and a, like a different mindset than I had when I was their age. So yeah. I think it's going to be cool to, to dive into that, but it's always a privilege to talk to these young kids to help them think about how to imagine and, and achieve their future. Yeah, it's funny to me. I, I actually just finished reading Simon Sinek's Infinite Game. Yeah, yeah. And, and it, it talks a lot about that generosity and, and not viewing others as being competitors as much as being worthy rivals. And the fact that there's space for everybody that, that are serving right. others and right. making a difference right. in the world. And uh, it's just a totally different mentality than it was 10, 12, 15 years ago in, in the business world. I think it's a really good thing. Yeah, I mean, I think you're totally right. Like, you know, oftentimes people ask me, like, you know, why did you start Officium in 2019? How did you do it? You know, weren't you worried about, you know, the, the, the big elephants in the, in the room, in the market, you know? And, and I, and I kind of have that same sentiment that Simon Sinek um, has is, hey, the, the world is a really big place. Like, if you think about what we do, at Ephesium before we were acquired by Arise, and then afterwards what we do is you're looking at a marketplace of about 220 billion total addressable market, right? And so my thought process when I started it, and this might be an interesting insight for a lot of founders, is I Scott and I, who's my co-founder, we didn't really have this idea that, oh, let's go build a billion dollar services company. We're like, hey, let's go do a beta test with the market and see if the market's interested. Yeah. And what we have, so we started off with four people, $150,000 loan, and we're like, we have this new idea, the service stack, the maturity model, you know, decentralized networked resourcing and so forth and service economy. Let's just see what the market says. And if we get to, to a million, that's our first test. If we get to 10 million, that's the second test. And I think having that iterative mentality that Nelson Mandela Winner learn not don't worry so much about the big billion. Worry more about art. Do you have a market fit, and is the market interested in you? I think that was super beneficial to how we started. Yeah, I think it is awesome. But uh, so maybe there's some other founders out there that, that think a bit more differently. Maybe maybe more yeah. in tune with uh, with kind of where I come from. I mean, you know me well enough, Jonathan. Not motivated by the financials very much, yeah. and and those those targets aren't going to really do much to to convince me that what you're doing is really special but when you can show me that you're impacting lives when you're serving communities really well when you're decentralizing wealth when you're making a difference in the cx world which i mean you, so you you use both of those languages really effectively so let's go back in time a little bit jonathan i mean you're very good about understanding your audience and what motivates them 
Uh, so how are you able to combine all these different elements of, of what success looks like into one cohesive idea? I mean, it, it kind of started, I was sitting on my armchair, you know, one day in the, the music room, is what we call it, the house. And, you know, I was, I was kind of thinking about the future of service. And I looked down at my Wi-Fi router and kind of in a, I'll say a 90 second moment of inspiration, I had built the entire company construct in my head. And like the idea that I had was, I was like, well, if you have on the Wi-Fi router, you have kind of the main hub, right? Mm -hmm. And then if you have a mesh network, you have nodes probably throughout your house to extend the value output of that internet access for usage throughout your house. And then, then there's bi-directional value because the people that are using it, they get value from that experience, right? And then of course, if the internet works, then those people continue to buy internet service. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, well, actually, I think that's the future of service. What you need to create is a network, a global network of, of kind of workers or resources, um, of technology, and of clients. And if you can c connect those, and there's bi-directional value, value between the client nodes, the technology nodes, and the worker resources employee hubs, right? then you're going to have a stronger mesh network. And imagine that that mesh network grows and scales globally, then your people are going to want to leverage what the services that your, your network is providing. And so then I thought, well, like, okay, so that's pretty interesting. So, I, so that's one piece of it. The second piece is like the few, this was pre COVID, right? The decentralized work is the future. You look at all the statistics pre COVID Absolutely. 61, 70% of people had a second gig. We're working from home, wanted to work from home, and then COVID hit and it kind of blew up, right? But the the other idea was like, hey, this also supports a decentralized network of talent, which not only gives more opportunity and more purpose to more people around the world, the kind of the philanthropic side, it creates economic opportunity in parts of the world that doesn't exist today. Like I grew up in the, the backwoods, the country of Texas, and where I grew up, the job that I have today did, didn't exist, right? But now it does opportunities like that do exist because of the FACIMA rise and so forth. And so that, I think that's the second component. And that, that has a natural knock-on effect of moving economic wealth from tech hubs to local communities where mm -hmm. people can choose to live where they want to live with their families, uh, with their, you know, whether it's the beach, the mountains, whatever they like, right? Whatever brings them peace and happiness. And then they can bring that, their kind of economic capital there. So I think that's a key component. And then the third key component, which I think really makes this, you know, kind of a, a complete trifecta picture, is when you look at the capability of these resources. If I started a fist team in San Francisco and I only recruited 25 miles out, I only have maybe a million people to pick from. Mm -hmm. And then I have to pull it down. But I have like a billion people to pick from globally. Like, I mean, if I would have started in San Francisco, you and I never would have met. Um, because I would, you know, you're in Tennessee, I'm in California, right? So I think when you think about, you know, starting a company, you think about the future, I always want people to think about like, not only what's the philanthropic edge that you can mm -hmm. do, because I think everything needs to have a greater purpose. And I think you'll find Zen, Gen Z buyers, millennial buyers, that's really important to them, which is great, because it should be important to everybody. Um, and then if you then think about how do I future proof this? And how do I make this a business that can be around for a decade, for two decades? I think it changes your mindset. And I think when I looked at the Wi-Fi router and I thought about the future of service, there was the business model, but then there's this, how does this impact the world? And I think that's kind of what you're touching on as well. Goodness. Yeah. I mean, as, as you know, I mean, I've, I've been describing the work of customer experience as making people's lives better and easier for years. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, ever ever since reading the effortless experience, and I feel like Jonathan, I mean, you tap into that so well with this business model and with your heart as a founder to make people's lives better. I can work where I'm the happiest yeah. and make them easier for organizations to find the top talent that they need to execute well and and create customer experiences that they never thought possible. Yeah, I mean, the the word that comes to mind as you're talking is seamless, hmm. and so you make the resourcing seamless. You make the value seamless. You create an ecosystem that allows those to seamlessly work together. And then what that does 
is it creates an amazing team with high employee satisfaction. And as you know, happy people deliver happy, better experiences, right? Mm-hmm. And so, you know, people that like you and I both are, you know, great benefits of this and other folks, and side of a fist human arise, it gives you that enormous flexibility to do things with your family, do things that you want to do that you're passionate about, but also do purposeful work in a seamless way. And, and I think that's the key. So as you think as a founder, what, not only are you, is the product you're making, is it disruptive? Great. If it's disruptive, but is it seamless and easy? Is the barriers to entry easy for people to, to get value from it in an immediate time frame? And then yeah. what's the long-term value story? Those are some things to think about as well. Gosh, I, lo- I love that. I, f- I feel like that is a call out to a lot of founders out there that are are thinking a lot about money. I, I would interject that in most situations, time is even more valuable. If, if you can find a way to truly save people time, that the money will follow, <laughs> undoubtedly. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's 100% true. Like when you think about the priorities of humanity, it's really hard for human beings to get past the money equation until until they have security. Mm. And then once they have security, then it's easier for human beings, and since founders are humans, it's easier for founders then to start to work towards a greater purpose. Now, if you can have, one of the things that Scott and I did in the early days is we were we were less worried about the money and we were more worried about core values. Yeah. And so if you build a business that has a strong set of core values, that has an interesting market fit, even if it's not fully monetized, and then you have talent, so you have the people to deliver it. If you have those three things, that's, again, another trifecta that you can leverage to really scale a business because your your business will change. So like with Officium, when we started, we had a business model, but then COVID hit. So we pivoted a little. We kept the old business model, but we added a new thing because the business had changed, but we didn't change our core values, right? Yep. We didn't change our the culture and the people, but we changed our business model and we pivoted a bit. And that's pretty normal for a founder. I think yep. the average of the founder usually pivots two to three times before they find that ideal product, you know, they can scale, right? Oof. And so I, I think that's super important to think about. I love it. Yeah, me and you almost got stuck in London. Yeah. I mean, things yeah. really hit hard. That was wild. That was my second month with Officium. Yeah. And uh, talk about a pivot. Uh, that, that was wild. So, Jonathan, this is completely unscripted, but I, I think this would be really beneficial for the founders. So, I mean, you selected a co-founder with Scott. I, I would love yeah. to learn more about what, what are some of the attributes that you were looking for in that co-founder and how have you worked as a team? I, I think any time that you, you find, kind of found a business, you know, I, I'm of the belief that it's best to have two founders. I don't think you should have three or four. I think it gets more difficult. So I think first of all, like found a business with one person that's a great partner. Mm. I think it's important that you have trust between the two people. I think it's important that you complement each other. So you think you bring different things to the table. I think it's important to have mutual alignment around your core values and what the initial business model is gonna look like. And then the most important thing is I think it's important that you can be truth tellers to each other. And and I think that if you can do those things, it's less important whether your founder is a tech person or a business person or a BD person, depending on what your product is and what you're developing, it's naturally going to happen. Scott and I are unique in the sense that we're both services founders, right? Mm -hmm. So usually you have like a tech or product founder and then another one, right? So we, we didn't start a business with tech and product. We started it from the services standpoint and we kind of integrated and built the tech later. But I think like with Scott, you know, he's the pragmatist. He's the guy that says, why? And I'm the guy that says, why not? And I'm like, <laughs> I'm the visionary, right? And we're both truth tellers to each other. Yeah. So we can yeah. have those honest conversations, those difficult conversations and then, then we can make decisions together. Yeah. And I think that's the other piece is when you have a founder, like get an equal partner. Yeah. Um, I would say equal partner in ownership in the company, equal partner in decision making, equal partner in vision creation and execution, right? That, that's super important. Um, it's less important whether it's you know 
two men, two women, a man or a woman, it doesn't matter. I think it's just two people that that meet those criteria, I think is super critical. And Scott and I, you know, we worked at Kabam and Forte before, and I knew that in order for me to scale a business, I needed Scott. And so, you know, and, and he thankfully needed me and, and it worked out really well for us. Uh, I think, I mean, this might sound a little odd, but I mean, I, I get a great deal of security working for you because of the friendship and the partnership that you have with Scott, yeah. that there is, there's just a lot of security and trust that, that is formed in that partnership. So I, I think what you're saying is really awesome. And I think it is super important for people. Yeah, 100. So I think there is kind of a natural segue there. I mean, Jonathan, you talk a lot about mental health and, and yeah. this is an important thing for founders that are going down this path to, to insulate themselves, to protect themselves in this area and find some balance, find some harmony in their lives as they pursue this dream. Uh, how have you done that? You know, I think it's, it's interesting. So Nate, you know, most of the audience that's listening probably don't know, but you know, I, you know, I suffer from chronic anxiety, PTSD, and, you know, as we started to, to grow the business, you know, I, my wife also got pregnant and we recently, you know, had a child. And, and I think what's really important as a founder is if you don't take care of yourself, you can't take care of your business. Indeed. And I think because we created such a unique and flexible model, like people may not know that I took time off. But because I have such flexibility in my work, I could take two hours off in the middle of the day if I needed to take that time for my wife, for myself, for my child, you know. I could take, I could take a week off and know that Scott's there or you're there and be okay. Like and I remember some interesting conversations that Scott and I had. And this is all about the balance of what your priorities are and what your objectives and expectations are. But we, when we were early on, there was some rough mental health issues at the beginning of COVID for a lot of people in the company, not just yeah. Scott and I. Mm -hmm. And yeah. we made intentional decisions to decrease revenue focus and to decrease growth and make sure that the culture was solid yeah. and that we people felt like they could take care of themselves. Because yeah. we knew that if we did that, like the business will come back. But you got to take care of people first. And so I think just having that ethos, it helped me to be like, okay, I'm going to take a week off. Or like I took three months off for paternity leave, right? Or, you know, I need to go get some help, you know, from my therapist or from my psychologist. Or I just need to like detox a little bit because it's just a bit much sometimes when you're a founder. So I think you need to give yourself permission as a founder to to do those things and be okay if your business doesn't grow as fast as you want it to grow but mm -hmm. like take care of yourself i think jeff bezos was asked the question once where was what are the three most important things that you would tell a founder and the first thing that he said is get eight hours of sleep wow smart and i think that's super powerful because if if you have the appropriate sleep whether it's eight or seven or nine whatever is right for you yeah then your mental health and your decision-making is going to be better. And so one of the things that I've been doing for the last three years since I started the company was get eight hours of sleep. And I'm, yeah. I'm super religious about it. And if I can get nine, I'll get nine. And, I, and, I, and I go to bed early and, and I get up early because of my kid, but I do it so that I get that sleep because if I sleep and I take care of myself and I can be better for everybody else. And I think oh. you know that's the culture that we've tried to instill at Officium that I know exists that arise as well, and that we would in, encourage anybody that is having mental health challenges, you know, whatever you're going through right now, focus on that and take care of that. Because whatever business stuff, the business stuff is always going to be there. But your yeah. livelihood, your your the strength of who you are, the the hope that that you that you desire to have to continue to do amazing things. Sometimes you just got to take a break mm. and be okay that everything's not okay. And then just get back to the work when you can get back to the work. So. Yeah. Good words. I, I think if you're, if your dream really matters to you and, and hopefully it does, and it has the potential to do great things for a lot of people pursuing that with more of a marathon mentality than a sprint mentality 
it is going to be much more sustainable long term. Yeah, totally agree. OK, well, so, Jonathan, you selected these gifts the, that you have to, to apply into this unique world of customer experience yeah. and specifically developing this thing called the service stack. Uh, unpack that a little bit more for us. Yeah. You know, I, I've been kind of in services for 20 some years. I knew when I was quite young that I would get a lot of inspiration and fire from helping other people. And, and so as I've been working in the services area, what occurred to me over the last 20 years is that there wasn't like a standard framework and a maturity model that was put forth that any company could use to deliver best in class services and through profit through the mm -hmm. service area or ROI. And so what the service stack is, is it's the, the front end of the, the maturity model. And we invented it and trademarked it. Obviously the service stack I invented, Nate and I invented the, the maturity model. And what, what it, it does is the stack, it has their CRM kind of features and capabilities. The second part of the stack is AI, tech, analytics, BI, all that kind of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. uh, automation. And then the third part is resourcing um, and then how, how and when you resource and so forth. And so what we did is we created this framework to help companies really think about what does their service stack look like? And then the maturity model is sits underneath the service stack and it's an eight pillar framework that has a hundred features inside of the, the framework or the product that helps companies understand like, where are they at? Are they basic? Are they standard? Are they best in class, right? And then if they're best in class, then they're already, they've already proven ROI of CX. And if they're not, we believe that a lot of companies out there would get a lot of interest from this product to help them to develop the ROI of CX, to, to speak the language of the power cores, to invest in them, right? And so that's what we started, the $150,000 loan, four people, service <laughs> tech. We got five customers. In the first two months, we were profitable. So we felt like, hey, market fit is there. So then yeah. how do we scale? And so then from that point, then we scaled and we built out our consulting arm or, or what was called the Fissium Transform, which is now a Rise Gig CX Consulting. We built out our frontline kind of flexible staffing arm, which is game testing, moderation, customer service. Used to be a Fissium Connect is now a Rise Gaming. Um, and then we had some product suites that supported that uh, yeah. as well in the Innovate arm, which is now part of CXK Consulting. And so the idea again is market fit. Like if you want to be a founder, you have to you have to find a model that people are going to buy. Like you, uh -huh. unless you're unless you're setting up an NGO, you do need to make some money. Um, and so I think as a founder, as you think through that, the faster you can get to market fit, the better. And then figuring out well, how do then I scale this mm. and make it scalable? And a key point uh, that Scott and I had was sustainable. Yeah. Like we could have grown the business much faster than we did. I mean, we, we grew pretty fast. We got $10 million in the first two years, would, but we could have even grown faster, but we decided to be sustainable. Yeah. And that was part of kind of our ethos and our core values as well. Mm. Yeah. It reminds me of that Donald Miller uh, building a story brand methodology and, and thinking through, you, you are not the hero of the story here. It's, it's actually the customer. It's the market. That's right. That's and, right. and you are positioning yourself as the guide. So the more that you can truly understand the needs of the market, the needs of the customer, and be an effective guide to them, the more successful your business is going to be. Yeah, 100%. I mean, I think if you think about terms like guide, mentor, mm. coach, yeah, you know, yeah. Those, those are some ethos things inside of a fishing. Like we, we want to help people be them, their, their best selves. We want to help businesses be the best selves. And then we want to help the world be a, a better place. And so I think as you think through our ethos, that's completely in there. And I think that, you know, as a founder, you have to think about that from that perspective. Like, who are you bringing value to? Mm. And then how is that value being told as a story? Yeah. And I think this is what becomes super powerful in thinking about businesses in the CX area is because what's beautiful about a CX product or a CX service is that inherently there's a story that's already, that exists. Somebody buys the product, somebody uses the product, somebody leaves the product. There is already a, a story there. Now, how do you change that narration where the perception of value 
for the customer that buys that product goes, starts on that journey, stays on that journey longer, mm -hmm. gets more value from that journey, and then inherently will bring more value to the business. And I think that's that's the original market fit that was most interesting to folks about Officium. And then the flexible staffing, you know, you know, I, the phrase I always say is I'm not a sales guy. I'm here to bring value to every day. If I haven't done something for you yesterday, I don't deserve to, to be paid today. That flexible staffing model, right? I think mm -hmm. was it's something we came up with later because companies really need that type of bespoke kind of flexible staffing. But but it's all about, again, that value story. And I think founders have to think about that. Well, it's amazing how much the, the term customer success has caught on yeah. evolving traditional sales and marketing now to this idea of customer success, which is literally just maximizing customer value through partnership. So I mean, uh, you had that baked in from the beginning. Yeah. That's awesome. Awesome. Well, Jonathan, we're, we're getting into the twilight area of the yeah. interview here. I, I would love to just hear some lessons learned as, as you come out of this, you, you've just celebrated an incredible acquisition through, through a rise. Yeah. And, and we're all getting to, to celebrate that and amplify this original dream through the amazing team and resources of Arise. But but give us some just top tips that you've learned through this cycle. So I, I think let's go through a couple. I think, you know, the first one I talked about was who your founder is, right? So I think that's important. Uh, I think the second thing is what is your, the thing that you're creating in the market and why is it needed and how is it different? I think that's kind of the second thing. I think the third thing is really think, thinking about your core values, thinking about your culture and how you build the company initially and then how you scale it. I think the third one is some companies start, you know, without significant funding like ours. I mean, $150,000 isn't a lot of money, uh, but some folks start with, with more funding. So choosing your, your VCs or your angel investors or your partners and making sure they're aligned with your vision is, is I think, super critical as well. And then, and then I think as you start to scale a business, I'm a big believer in specializing your talent to be your first FTEs and kind of outsourcing everything else. So outsourcing finance, outsourcing legal, all the GNA stuff that you would do, all of those different particular pieces. In some cases, even SNM, you can start outsourcing um, as you scale your business so you can optimize your cost per unit. I think looking at flexible staffing and how you approach it is, is important. I also think, again, it depends on your local geography, but there are some pretty favorable geographies to start businesses in. Um, I had a buddy who just started a business in Dubai. Uh, and there's, you know, I'm, I'm not going to move to Dubai and start a business, but he, there's some enormous incentives there. So I encourage people to look at like, where do you want to start your business and where is it in it? Where are their business incentives, tax incentives, those types of things. I think those are, are super important. And then I think the last couple of things that I would say is, you know, get get some really good advisors. Don't get like 30 advisors. I see like a lot of startups getting 30, 40 advisors. Worry a little bit less about that and get some key, like four to five key advisors that you think can help you, you know, in close areas or challenges or gaps that you have and that can help you network and scale the business, right? And then give them some stock. So there's some skin in the game for them. So I would definitely do that. And then I think the last thing that I would do is like social marketing, social proof. Like a lot of companies, they don't start off with the marketing. I, I had a conversation with, you know, one of the board members that purchased us and, and he said, that, Hey, you guys were fighting a, a couple levels above your, your weight belt because of the marketing that you did and the stories that you told and, and how you approached it. And so I think there's a lot of power in perception and reality in the marketing space. And it gives you an opportunity to be more well-known, get more opportunities and get more early business as well. So those are some tips and tricks that I would think it'll be different for every founder, right? But I think in general, if you think about those, um, you should be able to have a, quite a bit of success if, if you're able to tick those boxes and so forth. But, you know, I think what One Business World does is great. I've listened to so many of their great founder stories, their presentations. I, I feel honored to be part of that, to, to impart some of my thoughts. Obviously, Nate, you know I'm on LinkedIn, Jonathan Schroyer. You can find me on Twitter. You know, I love to network and talk with folks. So anybody that's listening to kind of this fireside chat that we're having, 
uh, via One Business World or elsewise, just hit me up. I'd love to have a chat with you. And Nate, as always, you're you're an amazing fire chat side chat partner. Thanks for the time, man. Cheers. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for your generosity with your wisdom, Jonathan. Have a good Thank day, everyone. You.